Good morning. The Senate Finance Committee is now in session. We're here to consider um, several bills to, uh, that need to be voted on. And so we'll start with uh, which first. analyst is going first, Nathan? No, I'll go. I'll go. We'll go straight okay. down the line. Okay. Okay, the first bill on your list is House Bill 652. This is a cross file to Senator Kelly's bill. This involves the uh, guidance and reporting document prepared by the Office of Attorney General to help residential service agencies and educate them about misclassification of personal care aides. The, you've already concurred to the House amendments to Senator Kelly's bill, and this bill is in that form right now. So I guess if you wanted to be consistent, this would just be a favorable motion. Okay, can we get a motion? No motion. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that's everybody here. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next bill is the cross file of the Senator Hayes' bill on uh, the Secure Maryland Wage Act. The conferees have uh, come up with a, uh, a proposal. Uh, per, uh, solution to Senator Hayes's bill, and that is to basically adopt the House amendments. So, under the House amendments, uh, the airlines will remain out of the provisions of the bill, and there will be anybody under a service contract under living wage will not be subject to the bill because they're taken out of the bill. The House Bill 685 is in that for same posture right now. So, to be consistent with what the conferees have. Uh, decided what you haven't seen on the floor yet, but should be up any time now. You would probably move favorable on this bill. Okay, and if no further discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Okay, and the last bill for me is. House Bill 934, this is not a cross file. This came out of rules uh, recently, and the bill is clarifying. Uh, there was a, this law has been around for many, many years, probably a couple decades, and back then the Attorney General had a concern that it wasn't consistent and manner of death is also should be the same as uh, cause of death. And it's in one part of the bill. So what the bill does, consistent with a court case that was on this issue, it would specify that wherever you see cause of death, for purposes of appeal of a non-homicide case, wherever you see that cause of death, that manner of death is added by the bill. And, and again, these are only appeals where there is a non-homicide uh, ruling by the, by the uh, chief medical examiner and a person in, of interest can uh, you know, appeal to the secretary the decision of the chief medical examiner, which goes straight to AOH. Uh, there's also a reporting requirement here that the, uh, the, the, the health department should report to HGO and finance on a number of cases that are appealed. Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second in the discussion. If not, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. And uh, before we move on to Nathan, I just wanted to let you know that uh, during the discussion on House Bill 581, Essential Workers, uh, I mentioned that I was working with staff in the, uh, of ECM and uh, the Attorney General on coming up with language that, is far, that specifically narrows the bill and specifies that, again, if there's money in the state budget, that is the only time that this leave would be authorized under a pandemic. So Senator Augustine will be offering this clarifying, narrowing language on the floor when the bill is on third reader today. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Nathan. The next bill is uh, House Bill 108, and this bill is identical to Senate Bill 286, which passed the Senate unanimously earlier this session. This is the Behavioral Health Crisis Response Services Bill. Uh, you had um, opted to uh, concur with the House amendments on the Senate bill previously. Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second. If no discussion, then all in favor, please raise your right hand. Well, but whichever one. Okay. 
Thank you. The next bill is House Bill 584, uh, which is identical to Senate Bill 508, which passed the Senate unanimously earlier this session. The House is adopting the same amendments um, to, to deal with issues related to net energy metering uh, under limited circumstances for local governments. Okay. The moved and seconded. If no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. The next bill is House Bill 1007. As amended in the House, House Bill uh, 1007 creates a carve-out for post-2021 geothermal systems in Tier 1 of the state's RPS beginning in uh, 2022 at 0.05% uh, and increasing each year until it reaching 1% in 2027 and later subject to uh, specified requirements and alternative compliance payments. M MEA uh, must staff a related work group created by the bill and a, co and complete a related technical study. Uh, a presently existing obligation or contract may not be impaired by the bill. A post-2021 geothermal system uh, is one that is in place uh, on or after July 1, 2022. Senator Augustine is offering amendments that are reflected in a reprint in front of you that would uh, limit the bill to a study, uh, to the study and work group uh, portions of, uh, of the bill. Okay. Senator Feldman? No, here, I'll, let me yield. Uh, I want to make some oh, Okay, I'll Senator, Senator Augustine. You, you might want to go first. Okay, well, <laughs> let me just um, start by saying, well, yes, I'd like to do that, and I, I, I understand uh, from the description. So just to be clear, I think people kind of forget, we've already classified geothermal as a Tier 1 uh, source. So it's not like some of the other issues we've dealt with where we're deciding whether it rises to the level of Tier 1. So that's, that debate uh, happened in 2012. What's the problem has been that the wrecks um, are essentially worthless, and what we're trying to achieve here is a bit of a jump start um, an injection of some juice to really get geothermal in our state um, up and running relative to other states. We're lagging uh, seriously behind other states in terms of providing any kind of incentives for geothermal. So let me start by saying one of the things we've had the last few years has been a struggle to find some areas where labor and the environmental community could actually support legislation, both. It's always been a bit of a um, you know, we've had the Black Liquor Awards and all the rest. This is a bill that both um, are strongly supportive of. I just want to make that point. And the reason is because this uh, particular technology is very capital intensive. Uh, when you think about the kinds of jobs we're talking about, so from the labor standpoint, we're talking about local contractors, well drillers, HVAC installers, oil and gas folks. And then you've got, obviously, the, the clear-cut environmental benefits no emissions, uh, combustion. So you put that together, that's a pretty powerful combo. And all this bill does is has is a very, very modest, I mean, I don't know how much smaller a carve-out we could put into a bill here, very modest, and actually pared down even from the original version uh, to jumpstart uh, this uh, particular industry in a way that will give some value uh, to some of the wrecks. At the same time, I have to say, We've also been looking for a bill, it's not just for the environmental community and labor supporting this, that has bipartisan support. And if you look at the House, this bill passed out of the House Economic Matters Committee 20 to 1. 20 to 1. And let me just, Madam Chair, if you can indulge me a little bit, who are some of the folks who supported the bill over in the House? We've got Delegate Aarons from Senator Hershey's district. We've got several other Eastern Shore guys like Delegate Mouths, Adams, Delegate in Polaria from Senator Jennings District supported and voted for this bill. Delegate Krebs from District 5. Um, Delegate Jacobs back for, on the floor uh, for Senator Hershey. So I want to make those broad political points. But getting back to the specifics of the bill, there's some things about this that are important to try to get this going. It's about grid resiliency. Um, you're lightening the load. When you have more geothermal, you're lightening the load on the grid during peak summer demand. 
which was a problem in Texas. So there are some other policy goals we're trying to achieve here beyond just the raw economic up upside potential. And I should say, Madam Chair, the Biden administration is going to be going big on clean energy. And it's the states that can have an infrastructure in place here uh, that are going to be the beneficiaries of some of the federal largesse coming from the Biden clean energy plan. And I think this plays into that. So you have grid resiliency. And then another theme that's emerged in this committee uh, this past year or two has to do with equity. And this bill does something that we've never done before in an RPS bill. And if you look at it, it's about equity and spreading the benefits around not just to the rich folks, but further down with low and moderate income folks. So this is the first bill that we've ever had that has a sub-carve-out, a sub-carve-out where we're saying that 25% of the RECs have to, and not shall is the language, shall benefit low and moderate income Marylanders. That's a significant, I, I would say, breaking new ground. Thirdly, we've set up a structure here where some of the money, um, and if you look at page 14, this is actually a change in the bill, any of the alternative compliance uh, uh, dollars will go into a special fund specifically for loans, loans and grants uh, to promote opportunities for the growth and development of... And if everyone wants to take a look at page 17 of the reprint, you're going to see, um, let's see, page 18, yeah, page 18 of the reprint, we've added even some additional language beyond those ACP dollars a specific provisions that say examine methods to promote increased opportunities for the growth and development of small minority women-owned veteran-owned businesses. We're trying to really achieve a lot of policy goals through, I think, this bill in a lot of ways. With respect to um, this study language, and this may be where, where Senator Augustine is going, so separate than putting this bill in place, uh, we've put in this. I think this is only the beginning for geothermal. I think, as I said at the hearing, I think geothermal is where solar was 10 or 15 years ago. So we've set up a study. We're requiring the MEA to do a study uh, during the interim and come back with recommendations on other things we can do with geothermal. But there's also a work group that we're creating in this bill. Uh, that will also report back to the General Assembly. So we're gonna, the work group's going to get this, report, this study, and then the work group will come back before the next session with recommendations to even do more in geothermal. And so I, I would just say there are some things maybe from an implementation standpoint, I think Sarah Augustine has raised at the PSC. This group that meets during the interim can work through a lot of these issues and come back and we can do some fix up. But that's not a reason to sort of delay a year, whether it's climate change, economic opportunities, and all the rest. And finally, Madam Chair, I, I have to say that the PSC, you know, has raised uh, concerns. And at each time, there have been amendments uh, uh, put into this bill to address the concerns. So if I could, you know, let the committee know if you. The original opposition or concern letter they raised had some technical amendments which are incorporated into this bill. Um, there was concern about them, uh, the PSC being responsible for certification of some of the labor standards of the bill. That is now struck from the bill, and Department of Labor has to come up in this work group with some ideas on that. Uh, the carve-out that was in the original bill is now much smaller. Um, and finally, Madam Chair, the original bill dealt with geothermal systems um, post-January 1st, 2022, and the PSC said they wanted a lot more time. So in the House, they added six whole months. So this is now uh, dealing with geosystems that are in operation six months later than the original bill to July 1st, 2022, that gives them an entire year and a half to kind of figure out some of this. So. In, in, in summary, Madam Chair, I think that there's been an attempt to put together a piece of legislation that has economic upside potential for our state, has some clear environmental um, benefits, has a work group and a study during the interim that I think can address some of the, any of the issues that, that are raised to report back to us before 2022 session, and has bipartisan support, overwhelming bipartisan support in the House from some of the uh, you know, districts represented in this committee. So for all those reasons, Madam Chair, um, at the appropriate time, I'm going to move uh, to conform 810 to 1007 and move favorable. But I know uh, at the appropriate time, because I want to give Senator Augustine the, the uh, floor 
uh, for his proposed amendment and make his case. Okay. All right, Senator Augustine, and then we'll come to Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really do appreciate it. And I, I got to tell you all, there are some very interesting concepts that are in this piece of legislation that's been put before us, but they are absolutely untested. Um, the PSC has shared with us, obviously, that they actually don't have a methodology to be able to actually implement. They say that this is unworkable. But the part that will end up being workable is that the ratepayers are going to end up having to pay more money uh, because of this carve out. And I just want to walk through with you all just a little bit because I did a little bit of homework on this thing. After the hearing that we had, at which point they talked about the low income and what they've done in New York and they talked about school systems and why they needed it. I, I met with the folks, right? Um, and they share with me and I asked them for a couple of things. I asked them for how, you know, they talked about how it worked in New York with this company called Dandelion. Now I gotta tell you guys who Dandelion is as well. Dandelion was spun out of Google. So Dandelion is actually a Google subsidiary. I want you to understand who is going to receive this additional money. It's Google. And so I asked them for information about the low income uh, benefits that they talked about that they were providing in New York and everything else. They have not given me anything because it doesn't exist. In fact, they had to actually own up to that that there is actually no information, although they came on our Zoom and presented it, that there was, but there in fact was not. Then they also asserted that school systems were not able to do these projects because they needed this as a financing method and everything else, and they, they asserted specifically my county, Prince George's County, and repeated it here in that, in that Zoom, and then repeated it in the meeting that I had with them that the reason why Prince George's County was not uh, doing geothermal was because the money was not right. And what I said to them was, okay, well, I want to call my folks at Prince George's County. And it got silent in this conversation. It got silent all of a sudden. And so I did. I talked to the director of facilities who does these things. I work with him all the time on these things. And I learned a lot about geothermal. And what he said was, no, Malcolm, it's never a financial issue. It is a design issue. We have a design issue. And so they, I, what I learned is that it works in high schools where they do do it, where you have to use uh, football fields for the wells. I learned a lot about this, which is fine. It's good stuff. But it wasn't a financial issue at all. That's the point. These folks made presentations in here about what and why this was important. And then it, 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 there were just the underlying facts for which simply were not the case. Senator Feldman already mentioned it. It is already in tier one, which is fine. But if you recall what they said in here to us was that the reason that they were going gangbusters, I think was the word that they used with regard to installing geothermal today in Maryland, but they weren't being, the reason why the numbers were low was because they weren't registering for the RECs because the RECs were low. Now, now, colleagues, I want you to listen to that. If you're going gangbusters and you don't need the RECs, great, keep building them. Why do you need a carve out to take money out of the pockets of the people that I was sent here to represent in order that you can increase your profit level, because that's in the end, if you're already making arguments that you are able to do these projects and it's all going fine, why would we have to do that? Now, as I said, the, P you know, the PSC has said that the way that this is set up is unworkable. And when this was on the voting list the last time, I talked to the sponsor on the House side, at least, about well, what can we do because what if these companies, which is what I believe that they will do, because I think it's admirable that they put in the LMI elements and everything else, what happens if they just don't do it? They don't do the low and moderate income stuff. What happens? There's nothing in the bill to stop that. 
The carve out then becomes a 0.75 carve out and they do business where they want to do business. And it's just a red herring that they put in here, the LMI. They've got no methodology within here in order for us to figure out how to make this thing actually work. Colleagues, this is a mess. It is a mess, but there are underlying elements of it which make some sense to study, which is why I have the amendment to study this. No one in the PJM has done this carve out. Everybody else has done solar. There is no geothermal carve out that would benefit Google and those folks who have been calling. I'm sure they've been calling you all too. And so I will press that we move on solely on the study so that we can figure out, get this thing right before we make a change that's going to cost our ratepayers money. Thank you. Okay. We'll go next to Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do appreciate the concerns expressed by my friend from Prince George's County. Uh, but having said that, um, I believe that Senator Feldman articulated the merits for why it is appropriate to pass the legislation uh, as it is before us without uh, amendments that simply turn it into a study and that's usually the death knell is you know let's take a a good bill and turn it into a study and I think the bill before us is um, third we get the bill moving there will be more than enough opportunities in the future to revisit this legislation and how it is being enacted and <clears throat> if the concerns articulated by uh, my friend from Prince George's are in fact manifesting themselves and there will be an opportunity to address them and we are constantly revisiting these issues and that's the right way to do that there's nothing wrong with coming back and saying we need to tweak it here or make an adjustment there but I think the time has come to move the bill um, as Senator Feldman mentioned it passed overwhelmingly from the House with bipartisan support and it has been thoroughly analyzed and debated and I think it's time to uh, to move the bill. Um, uh, I know Senator Feldman said he would offer a motion to move the bill, but I'm going to offer the motion uh, to move the bill without Senator Augustine's amendments. Second. Right, we're going next to Senator Klossmeyer. Well, I guess this is discussion time now. And I have to say that... Um, I agree with my friend from Montgomery County, but th this bill, it, it, when you have the environment, environmental folks and labor all working together, I mean, what else can one ask for? I mean, it doesn't happen too often. Uh, it doesn't happen often enough. But I, I think it was a, a, a great way to introduce this bill, to have all that support. And um, I, I really uh, think industry is involved environmental justice is involved, the NAACP is involved, and everybody li likes this bill. And if it doesn't work that the uh, uh, folks that are um, in the middle class and lower don't, don't get what they, they want, we, as uh, Senator Feldman said, we're going to be studying it this summer uh, over the interim. So I'm for the bill, and I wish I could have seconded it. So okay. thank you. Senator um, Hershey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, but being able to implement this is a completely another uh, additional issue. And, you know, it, it's getting amazing when we decide to, we're going to listen to PSC or not listen to PSC or completely ignore them. And, and they, have, they have probably been more involved in this piece of legislation than anybody else. They have said several times the methodology in this bill cannot be implemented. It can't be done. 
but yet we're going to put a bill out there because certain groups say, oh, I like it, and another group says, oh, you included me, and another you know, group says, oh, well, I'm calling all my legislator. This helps me out. Nobody understands this bill. It is a very, very complex bill, and as been said many, many times before, geothermal is already in our RPS. We already have it. And, and my colleague is absolutely right. They can use the recs that are in there. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, everybody forgets what the recs really are. We keep saying recs like it's some foreign entity that's out there. Recs are ratepayer subsidies, period. That's all it is. When you say recs, you might as well say money out of the pockets of the utility customers. That's what recs are. And here's another thing that we say, oh, this one little group here, needs more money from our ratepayers, And nobody understands this bill, so we're just going to say, yeah, you know what, everybody's on board with it, let's pass it. It's, it's great and we'll study it. we got six months to study it. PSC won't even be able to hire a consultant in six months. They'll provide absolutely no input on this bill before it has to be implemented. But yet, you know, it's got LMI in it, labor's behind it, oh, this is just the greatest bill ever, nobody understands it, it can't be implemented. I'll ask, and somebody can tell me how the well drillers are going to get, quote unquote, the subsidies for this bill. How will the actual installers of these projects get the money? Because that's who's calling us, right? That's who's calling my colleagues in the rural districts. That's why my colleagues across the, the road voted for this, because the well drillers are calling, it, calling them because they believe they're going to get ratepayer subsidies for this. Now, they won't say it that way which is very interesting, too. These rural county you know, contractors aren't running around saying, geez, I can't wait for everybody all across these service areas to subsidize my work. But they do think they're getting money out of this bill, and guess what? They're not going to. You mentioned, my colleague mentioned dandelion. That's behind this, too. There's another group, the ad hoc group, Bloomberg-funded group that's based in their ones. They've got their hands all through this, completely intermingled in this group as well, too. This is not being driven by local well drillers. They've been dragged into this and being the pawns in this whole scheme to try to get us to vote for something, to try to get us to understand it, to try to get a 22 to 1 vote over in the House what they got. This is driven by ad hoc, dandelion, which is Google. This is just another way that they're trying to, to insert themselves into our RPS and get the ideas that they want. The fact of the matter is this doesn't work. This needs to be studied. Keep in mind, the sponsor of this legislation in the House side introduced both this bill and a study bill this session. She introduced both. And she wouldn't introduce a study bill. She thought this was the greatest thing ever, right? But she got everybody on board, both sides. I'm not just saying her. Both sides got everybody on board to march in here and say that this is great. It's not good. It's, it's, a, it's time, Madam Chair, that we do the same things that we've been doing throughout this session, when the PSC advises us, when they take this strong a position on something and says that this doesn't work, we need to listen to them. And there's no hurry in passing this bill. No hurry at all. We can study it. We can come back next year. The well drillers haven't lost anything. It's still in the RPS. Big projects, as my colleague said, will still go forward. They'll still get the wrecks. Keep in mind what they want. When these wrecks, when these subsidies, when they're coming back and saying that they're not enough, it simply means that they're not getting enough money. They want the wrecks to go higher. When wrecks go higher, rate paying that they will never, ever, ever have the opportunity to use. Okay. And Madam Chair, with that, I, I would go, I, I agree with my colleague that this bill should be amended to study, that we take the time to figure out how a low-income credit will even be calculated. I mean, I will ask that question on the floor, and my colleague, I, I hope, will be able to answer that. But just tell me how a LMI customer will benefit from this bill, because we got them involved in it. And so with that, Madam Chair, I think it's time that we study this bill. We take, take a step back. We listen to the Public Service Commission. We slow this thing down. It's not a hurry. And let's listen to the people that are really the experts in this, okay. in this idea. Thank Third you. Vital. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I'm a big fan of geothermal. I know a little about it. I have family members that have installed the systems, and I know that they can be very, very effective. But I'm also a big fan of the Public Service Commission. And their first request that if we're going to insist on doing this is that we give it another year, which that's not the amendment in front of us. 
But I just had another email this morning from Lisa Smith at the Public Service Commission, and you know she supports everything that that our, my colleague on, on my right has said, and probably the colleague on my left. Um, and they really support this study. I'm just very concerned that we're putting something on the PSC's plate, who I think does a very effective job, and we're just not giving them the opportunity to have the input they need to have. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes, um, Madam Chair, you know, I, I too have great respect for the Public Service Commission, and just two weeks ago I brought that up um, and said of all the things they have on their plate, but it was a, a county bill, and it went through here. It sailed through here. I had many questions I wanted to talk to the Public Service Commission about, which I did. So I'm, I'm, I, all I have to say is that's not going to affect me I'm, I, because I just don't know where they are, what they're doing, and I can't, I can't do my work by getting texts from people asking me to put amendments in and everything else. So uh, uh, that's all I have to say. We passed the bill a couple weeks ago, and we didn't have the Public Service Commission's blessing. So that's all I can say. Uh, okay, Senator Thomas. Yeah, can I just address a, you know, a couple of points that were raised here? First of all, the idea that the PSC was ignored is, I mean, absolutely not the case. I mean, I have to just refer everybody back. I mean, their position has evolved. Now they're saying it, the difficulty of implementation. But, you know, when you look at their original uh, testimony, it was, number one, they raised technical concerns about the bill, which were addressed. Um, they were concerned about having to certify their labor, the labor standard uh, provisions of the bill. That was removed. They were concerned about the burden of having a reporting requirement that was too onerous. That was reduced. They talked about the timeline. We added six months uh, uh, to the bill in terms of the geothermal systems that are in, in play. And on the issue of ratepayer impact, I, I will say it's always a legitimate concern. But of course, we had no evidence or no testimony actually quantifying it. Usually, the Office of People's Counsel would come in if they had concern uh, on that front. They did not weigh in because of the way the bill is drafted between the very small carve-out um, and the ACP provisions. It was designed to minimize as much as possible any ratepayer impact. OPC didn't come in. Nobody who uh, had concerns about ratepayer impact testified in opposition to the bill. As far as the carve-out, I would also say that's been a big issue in this committee. One of the criticisms of the RPS, of Senator Hershey and everybody else, is the benefits flow to out-of-state folks. The reason we've been doing in-state carve-outs in solar is to actually get in-state job creation going. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing a small, really small carve-out. As far as the subsidies to the well drillers and all that, no, they're not talking about the ways that they're going to make. We're going to have more installations. It's not about RPS dollars going to their pocket. It's about this is going to help us have more installations in geothermal, and as a byproduct of that, the well drillers will, will make money. That's why they're probably weighing in in support of the bill. So, Madam Chair, I, I just would then broadly say, you know, I, I don't know about Dandelion. I mean, the, the woman testified that they would open a warehouse here if we pass this bill, all the stuff about Google. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to respond to that. But finally, I did want to say, we're going to have an interim work group and study. And this issue that Senator Augustine raises about how are we going to enforce the – I think that's a legitimate issue, but I don't know that that's reason enough to not pass the bill and get going on climate change, economic development. In the next six months, we can probably come back with some additional language to tighten that up. I think it's a legitimate issue he raises, but that's not in and of itself a reason uh, to not pass – what I think is, uh, you know, legislation that has broad-based support, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, Madam Chair. Okay. I'm hoping we can get this one wrapped up one way or the other because we've got one other bill and we've got to go to the floor. All right. Uh, let, let's um, turn around. All right. And, and can each of us be as short as possible this time? We want to give attention to the other bill we got. Okay. Um, Senator Feldman, if, if – it appears that you've got the votes for this. 
a bill, can we at least change the effective date, the um, term one more year so the PSC has time to do what they say they need to do? Yeah, Ma Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I am open to that, okay? So now that you've opened that door, um, now when you say one year, don't forget the original bill was January 1, 2022 for systems after that. In the House, they gave six months to July 2022. So when you say one year, are you talking December of 2022, a year from where the original bill came in, or a year from where, you know, the House bill, which already has a six-month extension, which, which, which are you referring to? Because um, I would suggest that if we go to December 1st of 2022, uh, then the bill doesn't have to be it's, it's, it's set up for post-2021 geothermal systems. If we take it past December 1st, 2022, then you've got to rewrite a lot of other provisions of the bill. But, Madam Ch Chair, if that is something that uh, allays your concern and, uh, and gives the, the um, PSC even more time beyond the six months in the House bill to help uh, to you know, figure out how to do some of the implementation, I'm not opposed to that since you raised it. So... I'll, I'll put that on the table for some discussion as well. But. Okay, I'm going to come over here to Kramer, and then we're going to Hershey and to Augustine, and we've got a vote. All right, well, just as a quick reminder, Madam Chair, if you are looking to expedite, there is a motion in a second on the floor already, but um, just in response to this notion of subsidies, and I'll be very quick, we have been subsidizing the fossil fuel industry to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars every single year, year in and year out, with tax credits and benefits that the fossil fuel industry has enjoyed for decades. The notion now that we might want to possibly offer some incentives to move forward with clean, renewable energy um, and, and what a horror that is, is laughable. If we can start to improve the destruction that the fossil fuel industry has left on our planet at this point by offering minor subsidies to incentivize people to go to clean energy, renewable energy, then I think we absolutely should go down that path. That's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I was very, very brief. Okay, you were uh, Senator Hershey, Senator Augustine, and then Senator Feldman, and then we got to do something, so, yes. Point of order. Uh-huh. So I'm actually sitting here listening to this bill, and I, I haven't, frankly, made up my mind. Uh -huh. um, I like the, I, I like the, I like the idea behind the bill here raised. Why is there not an ability to offer an amendment? I, I, I'm getting real tired of this crap where we say, oh, we're motioning one, we're motioning and it's a second. This is a deliberative body. Like, you can't offer an amendment because somebody said they motioned first and seconded real fast? I, I think that's wrong. I haven't made any ruling. I haven't made any okay, ruling. Okay, all right. Members say I don't think we need, I don't think we need to rush something through. I know there's another bill on the list. Maybe we should vote that bill and come back to this, but this seems like an important issue. I'm beginning to think that's a good idea. Could we hold everything in this current posture and let's just do this other bill and come back? Okay. All right. Uh, Patrick. So the other one's across the hall. Patrick has one beyond that. Oh, that would be the last bill on the list. So the, uh, the last bill on the list is HB 221, uh, Motor Vehicle Insurance, Use of Credit History and Rating Policies. Uh, you may recall that um, from testimony last week, uh, Chair Davis from Economic Matters presented this bill with the House amendments. As it was originally introduced, it would have uh, prohibited the use of credit history altogether in rating motor vehicle insurance policies. But the House uh, significantly amended the bill so that it um, requires a private passenger motor vehicle insurer, and um, it requires a private passenger motor vehicle insurer that uses credit information on request from an applicant or insured to provide reasonable exceptions to the insurer's rates, ratings, classifications, company or tier placement or underwriting rules or guidelines for an applicant or insured whose experience 
who has experience and whose credit information has been directly influenced by cer certain events that are generally out of the control of the applicant or, insur or insured. And so the bill lists some of these experiences, um, catastrophic event declared by the federal or state government, serious illness or injury or serious illness or injury to an immediate family member, death of a spouse, child, or parent, divorce or involuntary interruption of legally owned, owed alimony or support payments, identity theft, temporary loss of employment for a period of three months or more if it results from involuntary termination, military deployment overseas, or other events as determined by the insurer. An insurer has to notify applicants that reasonable exceptions are available and include information about how the applicant or insured may inquire further regarding the exceptions. If an applicant submits a request for an exception, an insurer at its sole discretion may require written and independent verifiable documentation, require the applicant to demonstrate that the event had a direct and meaningful impact on the applicant's credit information, require the request be, and require the, that the request be made within 60 days from the date of application for the policy. An insurer at its discretion also may grant an exception despite the applicant not providing the initial request for an exception in writing and can grant an exception where the applicant asks for consideration of repeated events or the insurer has considered this event previously. Um, the, within 30 days after the insurer receives sufficient documentation from an applicant regarding this requested exception, the insurer must inform the applicant of the outcome in writing or in the same medium in which the request was made. Okay, so really this went from what came in, or it was originally filed as a mandate uh, to an application process available under eight circumstances, two members, uh, 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 two rate payers, who, who, uh, insurers who uh, might feel that one of these eight circumstances apply to what has happened negatively to their credit rating, in which case then they apply to the insurer for relief from any um, uh, negative impact on their uh, insurance rates. And then the, uh, it gives you the timeline that the insurer has and, and the fact that they ought to, if they, may, if they are operating under this kind of an exception, they ought to let their insurance know so that people could apply if it becomes applicable. Senator Bottle. Madam Chair, do we have any um, testimony from the insurers? I think, they, I think they supported this with the amendment, didn't they? With the amendment. I'd like to move favorable. Okay. Any other? All right. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. That got up. Yeah, that's what we I, have, I have another thought on, all right. on all this, Thank on the you. geothermal We're bill. <laughs> okay, can I just put this on the table for the greater good of the, uh, okay, to Je uh, Senator Reedy's point, you know, it is legitimate. If some, I, 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 I do, uh, I am sympathetic to that point. If somebody has an amendment, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not averse to, you know, letting us take a test vote of the study bill that Senator Augustine has proffered, just, and we'll see. I mean, you know. Well, this way we'll know, and if that fails, then we'll go to the bigger bill. But let me, before we do that, um, I do want to say back on Senator Bottles. So I do have an email from Lisa Smith, and, and I, you know, it was sent to my state address so I can, and it was after a Zoom call that I had with the chair and with Lisa. So in the email, she says, Chairman Stanek mentioned that the PSC had requested an additional period of six months to implement the bill, six months from where the House was. And then she recommends in this email, this is again March, mean, what that means is for the post-2022 geothermal system language, it would be uh, that you play that for, for systems in service on or after January 1st, 2023. And I and, uh, just was talking to council, that would require us to do some, we could, and I'll let council explain if we were to do that, um, it, ha, it just would 
require us to then kind of go back to the original bill and then you start then from the following year with the percentages and, and Nathan could make that adjustment. So if, if this is, I guess, Senator Bidel, I just want to put that out there and, and, and I guess ask if that changes your view of the bill. Um, and if so, that might be something to put on the table before we take up again Senator Augustine's um, amendment. And it might be a good idea also to see if the bank of the other amendment That's, of the yeah. other motion. Because I, I don't want this bill to be jammed down because of a process issue. I want us to have a full vote on what's in front of us and that and I think that's the way we the committee should operate okay. and uh, so Senator Kramer if you might for momentarily because uh, again I don't think it should be who who gets the motion first that shouldn't really be the way we operate um, and so I think my sense is that if Sarah Augustine's uh, uh, motion for an amendment uh, does not pass then I would uh, yield back to Senator Kramer and we'll we'll take it up that but let's see where it goes okay and, but I, I would then, for Senator Bottle's benefit, okay. if it does fail, then I would probably I would offer this January 1, 2023 uh, date um, as part of our discussion for the bill. Okay, that sounds like perhaps a way to proceed. Okay. So. You're still fine. Okay, yeah. Senator. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you for the indulgence. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. I must say that I am um, I'm trying to come up with the right words for why one subsidy that 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 costs people justifies another subsidy that's going to take money out of the pockets of the people who sent me here to represent them, particularly when. It's a choice between an, elect, uh, an electric bill and a $5 copay for their prescription. So I actually take great offense, actually, to a characterization that that's somehow not some, someone or something that I should be looking out for. Because that's what, when we, when we pass these things and we, we pass on this money to the ratepayers, that's what these things do. And I know I've made my point. I won't go too much longer on it because we are where we are. But I just am saying that we consistently look out for everybody but the little people in these conversations. They get left to carry the load for Google, Bloomberg, and everybody else. And I'm standing up for them on this. That's why I still think that we should just do the study, figure it out, we get it right, then great. And then I'm done. Okay, Senator Reedy, Senator Hershey, I see any other light. Can, okay. can I ask just a question then about this? So I, 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 from what Senator Augustine has said, so this would make this a study and we would come back in a year with recommendations. Is that what the, okay. Senator Feldman, you're, you're, possible amendment if this doesn't go that would say that the PSC would have longer would they have longer to implement because I I'm getting the concerns too from the PSC and look I'm not an expert on this I'm trying to make the best decision possible they're saying that you know like converting BTUs to KWH or KWH to BTUs is a problem they're, they're trying to their, their engineers are telling them they could have issues does your amendment give a little more time or how does that work I'll go back to their own email that I recited they wanted this additional time number one to allow them to track and report on a calendar year basis and I I'll yield to counsel as to what the practical effects of moving that date back in terms of giving them more time uh, understanding that this technology has been in Tier 1 since 2012, so it's not like some newfangled technology that they're not supposed to already kind of have some But how it interprets to Rex is different, correct? I mean, it, yeah, be well, the rec mark. I'll, I'll yield okay. back to, uh, to, um, to Nathan about, you know, what that means. Changing the date to yeah, January yeah. 1, 2023. Very good. So um, using the rep – well, using House Bill 1007 – um, as the example here on, on page 3 at the bottom in lines 29 and 30, the House amended the bill to be July 1, 2022. My understanding of what we're considering here would be to uh, change it to January 1, 2023. And so that would have the effect of moving the entire process back um, uh, one year from the original uh, date as the bill was introduced 
What I did want to raise for the committee then is the effects that moving to January 1, 2023 would have on the particulars of the carve out. So looking to page six of the House bill, um, I'm now realizing that the reprint in front of you has all of this language stricken because we weren't originally considering changes to this, so I apologize. But if you, can, okay. if you can see on page six in 2022, um, this is under uh, uh, paragraph 17, as introduced, the carve out was 0.15%. The House amended that down to 0.05%. Now, one possible explanation for that was that it had to do with that you only had half a year for the systems to be put in place because the bill, as amended by the House, moved to July 1, 2022, and a post-2021 system was only a system that was installed after July 1. So if we change the date, not because I know the, I don't want to test the committee's patience, so we test, so if we change the date, we have to change that whole section to keep moving it up because we've Right. I mean, so essentially. 2020, it would need to move everything back to 2023. But from there, the committee would need to make a decision about what the percentages would be, because you would have the full year of okay. the systems applying. So would you want to use the lower numbers that were agreed to by the House, acknowledging that part of that may be because you only had half a year in 2022, but you'll see that the House further reduced the percentages of the carve out in subsequent years that were not affected by the only partial gotcha. year of implementation. And so the committee would need to have specific decisions about the percentages, okay. either the bill is introduced, the bill is amended by the House, or some blended version of this to acknowledge the full year of implementation in 2023. Okay, okay. So in closing, Madam Chair, so if we went with the Senator from Prince George's County Amendment, Senator Augustine, we would just say, let's study this for a year, and we can come back and implement this whole thing next year if we figure out how to do it, correct? And we would still be on track because we'd be planning it out. Um, well, okay. I, All right. Thank you. Senator Kramer, Senator Hershey, and we do have to get to the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will be very brief. But in response to this notion that we're protecting the little people, I will offer you that I'm looking at a federal climate change report that states low-income communities already have higher rates of many health conditions, are more exposed to environmental hazards, and take longer to bounce back from natural disasters. These existing inequalities will only be exacerbated due to climate change. This bill is about addressing climate change and protecting the people who are most vulnerable, most hurt, most at risk as we do so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Senator Hershey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple responses to Congressman Kramer's comments about the, what the federal government is doing. I've looked all throughout this, this book and I haven't found out any place where we subsidize fossil fuels. So I'm not sure where that argument comes from, but the Maryland General Assembly is not subsidizing fossil fuels, as he stated. However, we are looking, again, to form subsidies uh, for this very, very limited group. And, again, to respond to what the well drillers were looking for, they specifically said that their projects were unaffordable, that these were too high. They think that they're going to get the subsidies for these projects, when, in fact, we all know how these projects that work, when they become individualized houses, residential, commercial units, most of these projects, whether it's geothermal or solar, are financed. They're financed by someone because people can't afford these upfront costs. Who's going to get the money for Maryland ratepayer subsidies is Dandelion. Okay, it's been said over and over again. They're a New York City financing company, and they finance these types of projects, and they are the ones that are pushing this bill they are the ones that are looking for Maryland ratepayer subsidies. So let's, you know, not kid ourselves and think that all these well drillers are all of a sudden going to get REC payments. I mean, I challenge a well driller to tell me how they're actually going to, going to sell these RECs from an individual house into a market. Okay. It's not going to happen. Dandelion's going to get it, and that's, that's why I think we need to take the time. I agree with my colleague's amendment to put this off for a year. Let's take, let's take time to study it and come back with a bill that we know can be implemented. Well, we, we actually had a motion on the floor, and I got him to allow us to interrupt 
and not complete action on that so that we, but we have been listening and we, so at this point, if um, some, if the uh, uh, analyst can just restate the motion that, that is before us. I don't believe that it's been offered and seconded, but procedurally it would be to move favorable on the Augustine Amendment. Okay. There hasn't been a motion yet. Who made the motion? No, we, we had a motion before. Am I going? Please. Thank you. So since we are all procedural, um, I will make the motion. I also, again, will uh, just express my my disappointment with some of what has been said but and how folks have. I understand that, Madam Chair, but you know the editorializing sometimes but needs to be responded to. But we do on the floor now. I get that, okay. but I get really offended when people try to prove that we uh, do the amendment that I recommended, which has been shared with the uh, council, which is that we do this as a study. Now, I'm, I'm just not sure where we are. I, I think the, the, the issue was raised around procedure. There was a motion for the actual bill without the amendment. Now, and if the amendment was to come later, that's fine. But I don't even understand what we're voting on now. That, 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 well, that was my concern. I thought yeah. that we had had a motion. Sure. Senator Kramer did make that motion, did but he yielded. Because as a, I think it, it, he, I think he withdrew that motion to at least have a allow us to have, allow us to have a, an airing of the Augustine Amendment, and if that fails, we'll go back to Senator Kramer. I think that's how. So we I think we've got this earlier motion that was before us, and that's why I was going back. So, uh, Senator Kramer, would you just restate your motion so we can vote that up or down, and then we no, can. No, I think it was the opposite. Sure. Um, I think we. I will withdraw my motion okay. to move the bill in its posture without the amendment. So that is now off the table, and I believe Senator Augustine's motion for the amendment is on the table. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're voting now on the Augustine amendment. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, all opposed, please raise your hand. Okay. All right, so the August. All right, Madam Chair, I would now move the bill as it is before us. Okay. All right, and we got a second on that. Yeah. So all in favor oh, you, you of do the it? subsequent motion to move the bill as it is currently before us. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, Senator Bottle. Uh, I'd like to move the amendment that we talked about moving everything one year till January 1, 2023. So I don't have a written amendment, but I think Nathan... Okay. Okay. So... I think the question is, do we want to, for the purposes of the carve-out percentages and the years of implementation, go back to the bill as introduced for the percentages and then move everything out one year? That's what I'm, I'm asking to clarify. So it would be, so as I said, the, the House, so currently in 2022, there must be at least 0.05% derived from post-2021 geothermal systems. As introduced in 2022, it was 0.15% derived from post-2021 geothermal systems. If we move everything back a year, it would be post-2022 geothermal systems, and we would be talking about 2023 in terms of the compliance year. And so the question then becomes, are we going with 0.15, which was as introduced, or 0 0.05 as amended by the House, acknowledging that the House is counting from July 1 of 2022? Does that make sense? Um, Senator Feldman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, Nathan, just from a, a simplicity implementation standpoint, again, we are now giving the public service longer time to do their thing under this. And again, I, I'm not sure if we're in a 5-5 situation. We may need to revisit the – but um, in terms of just ease of implementation, uh, if we go with this, Jane, just could you weigh in with a thought on implementation simplicity here? The, the amendments can accomplish whatever the committee decides to do. So we can – moving the years, it, 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 is a, okay, it is a policy decision for the Finance Committee okay, so what, what percentage what, you want. What I would suggest is because now we're moving it out a year, the House, you know, did this sort of de minimis, really small, small uh, carve-out number because it was, you know, this July thing. I would just say we go back to the original bill and you start with the numbers that were in the original bill. Of course, now starting one year later, is that uh, something that we can do? Let me ask can you a question. Question. Yeah. What is the easiest way to get the general uh, direction that we're going in across and on the floor at this late date? In terms of how much time the analyst is going to need, if he's got to redraft a lot of stuff. Which is why I think we need to get it voted now. So that That's what I'm thinking. So we know, and he know what he has. I, I, I'm comfortable with the model uh, amendment pushing everything out a year. What I'm suggesting is all we do is go back to the original numbers, and we're just pushing out everything one year later. Well, remember, we got two bills that need to. Right, but they, they, we can, can, they'll just be conformed. Could you make a motion so we can be clear on what it is you're suggesting? Well, I'm, I'm saying I, – I'm, I'm saying that we would take the amendment that Senator Bottle has proffered, taking the July 1st, 2022 system uh, date and moving it per the email I got from the Public okay. Service Commission to January 1st of 20 – I think it's just one year moved out, one year later. That's a pretty substantial difference. Um, the original bill, for instance, for 2022 was 0.15, and that I would think the better amendment would be to just move all of these numbers out one year. I mean, that's what you're really trying to do is really just delay the entire implementation of this for one year and then just take each of those years and, and you take the 2022 number and you make that the 2023 number, the 2023 number. Becomes okay. a 2024. Okay, now. that I just talked to council. Could you just weigh in that with how that would work? So to summarize, Senator Hershey, you're you're suggesting that the finance committee vote on the bill as amended using the House amended percentages, but moving everything back one year. So Correct. instead of 0.05% in 2022, it would be 0.05% in 2023. And, and yeah. 0.15% in 2024 exactly. rather than 2023. Okay. Yes, that is Okay, so that's – I'm going to put that on the table. Uh, but okay, do but we, we have a yeah. second to do that so we know what we're talking about? Okay. On the amendment, you've got to vote the amendment first. We've got to vote on that amendment. But we were saying the amendment oh, okay. in okay. terms Fair. of the timeline. Okay, line. gotcha. Okay. All right, so all in favor – Please raise your hand. Just on the amendment. So uh, on the amendment. Okay. Okay. Hershey, it was your idea. You don't want to support that amendment. <laughs> All right. Now on the bill as amended. Then. Yes. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Senator Hershey, uh, Senator Vital, is this? On the bill as amended. With your amendment. Okay. Okay. Well, wait, is Senator Benson a yes or a no? Yes, she's a yes. Where's a no? No, he just raised her hand. Yeah. Where's a no? No, we need to clarify Senator Benson. Yes. She's a yes. Okay. She's a yes. Two no's. Two no's. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Thanks so much, colleagues. There's another bill. Oh, we got another one? So we would then. Con considering what the Finance Committee has just uh, determined to do Conform on House Bill. Conform the cross file to what we've just done. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, we are fine. Okay, same thing. Chair, Madam Chair, can I just make one final point? Under this bill, that there's a work group, and I would suggest and recommend that that work group, it has one Senate member, and it's Senator Augustine, if he's willing to be part of the work group, because he can work. They, they, no, that's okay. I, actually, we do want you there. Okay.